Here's a collage that I drew uh, to commemorate the return of the governor this week, brothers and sisters. I uh, certainly hope you enjoy it as I tried to kind of hit some of the main characters uh, on there as well as uh, some walkers and, and the cell block of the prison and everything else. So if you like this type of thing and more, remember to follow me on all the social networks. The Walking Dead, Season 4, Episode 6, Live Bait. Well, hello, my brothers and sisters of the Dead Nation. I, as always, am Jim, here to bring you another review on uh, the wonderfully action-packed, grisly, and epic-gripping tale of The Walking Dead. Uh, this week's episode, of course, was entitled Live Bait and marks the return of everyone's favorite asshole, the governor. At the end of last week's episode, we, of course, saw the governor, just the, the, the side of his face very briefly, just kind of, you know, peeping Tomming on the prison, and then thought, well, geez, the next week's episode is live bait, so he's going to capture somebody, and he's going to do this, and he's going to use them. And ultimately, that's not what they did. Now, some of you uh, will actually hate what they did. Some of you will dislike it. Some of you will be like, it was great. You know, uh, some of you will be indifferent. I personally, um, I think that I'm aware of the comic books and the side books that they have. I actually own two out of the three. I think the third one is coming out. And I have not yet read them, but they're all like the rise of the governor and how he came to be and his backstory and everything else. And how he came to be who he was, this crazed kind of sociopath, sort of just homicidal maniac. Um, and I heard that he's been toned down in the in the actual series over here. So this episode was all about him and showing what happened from the exact moment that he gunned down his whole Woodbury crew at the end of Season 3 uh, and then showing the months to follow. Now, uh, there's a couple things that can be taken from, from this episode, and I'll get to them as we come to them. But it starts out with the governor, of course, right after he gunned everybody down. And, um, and basically, he's like in shock. It wasn't a premeditated thing that he did. It was a spur-of-the-moment thing where he used bad judgment, clearly an error in judgment, as many of the things that he did that were kind of evil and sadistic. I think in the end, you know, he was, he was he's a protective father that wanted to believe and hold on to the thought with his daughter last season that there was a way of coming back from this, that there was still going to be someone or something if they held out long enough that would save them, you know, and I really think that was, it was a father's blind fury, really, and, 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 and love, I guess, too, for his daughter that really kept him going, you know, throughout this whole thing. When he lost her in the mid-season finale of last year, Michonne obviously putting the sword through her head, even though she was already dead and we all know that and everything else, that's kind of, in my mind, what triggered some of the real evil nature in him. I think before that he did some things that were pretty were pretty terrible, but I think ultimately he was able to justify them in his mind and his way of doing things. So uh, this episode starts out again right where the end of last season left off, and it's later on at night. You know, he first gets in the car with Martinez and I think Schubert or Shempert or something the other guy's name was, and um, and, and they get in the car and they're just driving. And that had to be a lonely, just cold drive because the governor is just cold and withdrawn, right? And the other two guys are just like, man, this is fucked up. I just, I'm glad he didn't shoot me, right? So they're at a camp later on that night, and a walker comes stumbling into the camp. They got a campfire and some tents out, you know, and they're roasting marshmallows. And the governor's just sitting there, basically, you know. And this thing just keeps walking towards him and eventually stumbles over, falls into the fire, starts on fire a little bit, gets close to the governor, and then Martinez comes out of his tent and puts a hole in it, you know. Puts a bullet in its head, and you're thinking, man, I can't believe these people are still loyal to this crazy son of a bitch after he just gunned everybody down, right? So anyway, he winds up going to sleep, and you can see he's just sort of in this shock. And he wakes up the next morning, unzips himself from the tent, unzips the tent, looks out, and Martinez and the other guy, they're gone, okay? They got the hell out of Dodge. They don't want to deal with this crazy psychomaniac, and they know, hey, listen, he got more bullets, and I don't want him to shoot me for just going against him, looking the wrong way, or, you know, maybe Martinez farts in the truck. I don't know. Um, so they're gone. And then the next several minutes is just kind of this montage with a really cool song playing in the background. I'll have to look it up, actually. Um, but really kind of neat. And he's just sort of wandering, you know. And as he's wandering, it must be for months because he starts to go. He's still got the eye patch, obviously, but the hair starts to get all strewn and, and long. And he starts to grow a beard. And the beard is a good long beard, okay. Even by, like, somebody's standards who can go. I got a buddy who, like, shaves in the morning and he looks like the wolf man by noon, you know. And even by his standards... This guy, he, he grew in some some good facial hair. So he actually reminded me of anybody who, and this is dating my myself as far as age wise, is uh, Snake Plissken. Uh, it was played by, um, oh god, I can't remember, Kurt Russell. 
And a movie back in the, the 80s, when I was a kid, I used to watch it. It's called Escape from New York. And Snake Plissken had this eye patch and just kind of... <laughs> anyway, the governor, David Morrissey, uh, reminded me of that in here. So so that's what the first portion is, is just him wandering around. He eventually kind of just goes and stumbles into, uh, I guess, like a small town and walks by this apartment building. He happens to wind up seeing this little girl up in the window. And that's kind of what gets things going. Now, from what I've heard from several of, uh, of uh, my subscribers and, and friends and things like that, a lot of this backstory that comes to be was explained in the books. And I have no problem with them doing that, but they should have done it in webisode shorts or maybe in like a bonus episode that was just about him, uh, not in the actual 16 episode season. That's just my personal opinion. So the next, I don't know, maybe third of the episode is basically him going into this apartment building and bonding with this family. And this family is comprised of uh, an older man, the, the father, the grandfather, I guess you would say, uh, who has stage four cancer and is on oxygen. And his two daughters... Um, the younger daughter is an aspiring, I guess, a cop in training. And uh, I believe, if I remember right, her name was Tara. Uh, Tara. And then there's the older one um, that's that actually has a child. The child's name is Megan, and the older one's uh, name, and she's not even older. I mean, she's probably in her late 20s, early 30s. Uh, her name was Melody. So anyway, they, of course, are hesitant to want to let him in or whatever, but it's an apartment building, so they basically go and take his guns, and he's still withdrawn, not talking to anybody, and they tell him, hey, go... You know, go over here and sleep in the other, uh, you know, you can go sleep in this this place, you know, in, in the other, in 203 across the hall. So he does, and again, he's just real quiet and reserved. And then through a series of several different events, and you don't know what his thoughts are. He pulls a picture out of his family at one point and folds over uh, himself in there and just leaves his wife and his daughter in there, you know. And you really don't know. I, I think they're trying to make you feel for the guy and make you feel like, you know, he's one of those people that he's just... You know, he's just misunderstood, you know what I mean? And uh, and he's just doing the wrong things for the right reasons, you know, that sort of thing. But uh, as, the, as the, the show progresses, he winds up bonding with these people. He goes and gets this backgammon game from up in 303 that the grandfather asked for the, for the granddaughter because he plays a lot of board games with her. And as he's up there, he winds up finding a, a, a walker sitting in the bathtub that's uh, that had been shot but not shot in the head. And he stabs it, puts it out of its misery. He goes, brings him the game, you know, then he's going to leave and go out on the road and the daughter's like, my father's got stage four cancer and he's on his last bottle of oxygen. I know you've already done so much and I know we got guns and my sister's this uh, cop and all this other stuff, but like a couple blocks away, there's a retirement home, an old folks home. So could you go get us some more tanks? So the governor goes, and next thing you know, he's an errand boy. He's a pizza delivery guy. He goes over to the retirement home and uh, he dodges some walkers and just really tries to avoid them, you know, and you get to see... Uh, a retirement home full of walkers is what you get to see. People that are bedridden, and uh, now that they're you come back to life as, as walkers, they still can't really walk around. And uh, many of them are very slow, slower than normal, and uh, and you know wheelchair bound and everything like that. He goes and gets the gets to the, the the oxygen room wherever it is that there's a whole cart of this oxygen. And as he's wheeling it out, he gets assaulted by some of the walkers that are in there. He manages to escape narrowly with his life and two tanks of oxygen, bringing them back to the family. Now, all of a sudden, the family wants him to stick around, and he's living in the apartment across the, the hall there, and he shaves, he gets rid of the, the whole mustache and beard deal that he's got going, it looks a little cleaned up, and he starts bonding with the little girl, Megan. Probably reminds him a lot of his own daughter, she's a very sweet little girl that's been very withdrawn, and this Melody chick keeps just appearing and forcing her way into, like, talking to him, you know, and then tells him after hardly knowing him, she says, you know, uh, she says, well, you know, basically her husband walked out on her, went to get a Powerball ticket three and a half years ago and never came back. And when the daughter saw him stumbling around outside with his eye patch, right, looking like freaking Captain Ahab uh, or Snake Plissken, I guess she was like, oh, that's my daddy, you know. So he, she, this all gets laid on him. And, I mean, it's like an episode of freaking Maury or Jerry Springer. And uh, really was just a little uncomfortable for me. I kept wanting to just go, get the fuck out of here with the, with this Melody woman, you know. And, and Tara, too. She's a weirdo kid. Kept going here, pound it. Anyway, long story even longer. What winds up happening is uh, the father does wind up dying, even with the oxygen. He's got this stage four cancer, and um, and and he you know he dies, I guess, and it probably happened some hours ago. And basically, um, the, the two daughters are kind of wanting to have a minute with him, with the granddaughter, and the one daughter's kneeling down by his side, and you know, and the governor's like, "Hey, that's that's not good. You shouldn't be doing that." Uh, and they're like, "Just give us a minute," you know. And they have no idea when he died. And they these people have been living in this apartment building ever since, you know, um, ever since the outbreak a year and a half, two years ago. So they don't know 
that you have to shoot them in the head. They don't know that they come. regular people come back when they die, you know. So anyway, the father goes and goes to get up and grab her, grab the, the younger daughter, Tara or Tara. And um, I, I should call her Maggie 2.0. She looks like a, a younger version of Maggie. Anyway, and the governor winds up bashing his head in. And then he goes and he digs a hole for them because apparently, even though they're they're uh, women, apparently they're not even competent enough to dig a hole for, for her own father. He's got the father. He buries him, you know. And then he's going to go and he's going to leave, right? And then Melody comes out and says, uh-uh, you're taking us with you. And he's like, the hell I'm not, you know. He doesn't want to have anything to do with him. At some point, too, I think it was that, that night, he wound up going and burning the picture and I thought that was kind of symbolic, trying to burn the picture of his family and everything else. At the beginning of the episode, too, when he went on his whole journey and his little walkabout, he did wind up getting a truck and crashing through the gates of Woodbury that's now deserted. And we wind up seeing him. He's burned down the town. It's been taken over by walkers anyway. And I think that was kind of his way of separating himself and burning himself, you know, burning his old self and his past. And then even when he was asked initially when he came into the apartment building by Melody and Tara, he wound up telling the story about the place that he was at. The leader went crazy. And I think it's that he's just, he's like almost like uh, like schizo, like two personalities, you know what I mean? When that switch flips on and he does some crazy shit like mow, out, mow down all of his people, and then he comes back out of it and he's like, what did I do? I really think he has like a dual personality, you know what I mean? Like a two-faced type of thing. So he winds up grudgingly taking them with him because this melody goes and says, you know, oh, okay, well, you know, we, we need to go. We need to go with you. We're gonna, I don't know where they're going to go, but they're going to go somewhere. Excuse me. I've got a cold coming on, so my throat's getting real dry. So anyway, so they get in this in this box truck, and they go on this sort of forced-feeling journey driving along, and um, and they bond a little bit. Later on at night, they're sleeping. I'm not sure if, they're in, if they stopped in tents. They're sleeping in the back of the truck. But this amazes me because now the governor went, and we don't know how much sex he had from the time of the apocalypse started and he started Woodbury to the time he met Andrea. But we know that him and Andrea were getting down on the regular in, in season three until, of course, you know, uh, he put Milton in there after he shot, stabbed him or shot him and, and then, you know, she was killed. But the governor is the luckiest son of a bitch I have ever seen, okay? I myself, right... I can't get lucky in a women's prison with a fistful of pardons. Now take a moment to think about that that and rewind it if you need to or whatever, uh, but I will say it one more time. Couldn't get lucky in a women's prison with a fistful of pardons, okay? That's me personally, right? The governor, though, when obviously people of the opposite sex and, and that sort of thing, you know, uh, people willing to even want to have sex during the apocalypse, the governor gets laid by Andrea for several weeks, months, whatever it is. Then he goes and wanders around like a nutcase for a few months, happens upon this apartment building, and then the next thing you know, he's in a tent or laying there at night with this melody, and she turns to him, and next thing you know, he's getting it wet again with her. And she's a nice-looking woman, you know? And I'm thinking, son of a bitch, man. If anything the apocalypse teaches us, it's that the eye patch obviously, is sexy and brings women to you. So that's what I took from the whole episode. The governor got laid. So the next day, they're out on this journey, and they're walking around now because, um, well, the truck, of course, broke down. That just sort of happens. That's the, the, the plot detail or cliche, whatever you want to call it, uh, the little plot hole. And, uh, and as they're walking along, all of a sudden, they encounter a giant herd of zombies coming at them. So in this real kind of slow motion type moment, Megan, the little girl who he's bonded with, you know, who she also just kind of saw him bash her grandfather's head in. And, and really, you know, in all fairness, she's seven or eight. She doesn't know what the hell's going on, okay? My kids wouldn't either, trust me. They would have no idea what's going on, you know? My oldest one, though, he'd probably want to actually, he'd be like Carl, he'd want to hold a gun and shit, you know, and be helpful. But anyway... Getting off the beaten path there. So this winds up going and this herd is coming at them. And Megan's just kind of standing in the middle of the road. And they're like, come on, you know, the, the mom and the sister, right, or the aunt. And they're not, and she's not coming. And then, you know, Philip kind of looks at her, you know, governor, if that's even his name. He tells him, she, he tells them his name is Brian something, but whatever. Whoever the hell his name is, the governor, one-eyed Willie. He says, you know, kind of looks at her and she runs into his arms and they go running off, right? So the episode goes and just comes to a close shortly after that. They're running, they're running through the woods. Zombies, of course, are chasing them. Some of them have broken off. Some of them are slowed down by the weeds and the bramble and the bush. But, of course, they're slowed down, too, because conveniently the younger girl, Tara, wound up twisting her ankle right before they saw the herd. So she's hobbled and, of course, her sister's carrying her. Uh, the governor is carrying the little girl, Megan, and everybody's hopping off through the woods, going through the, the bramble, the brush, whatever. They get to some tall grass. Next thing you know, and Philip's running. I mean, the governor is running with her, with this little girl. And I feel like it's his replacement family. It's his second chance. He's bonded with them, whatever. It's something he cares for again, right? He goes and all of a sudden, <laughs> floor drops out from under him, and he's in like, like an eight-foot deep pit that's dug out that's got like three or four zombies in it, right? 
And he goes and just goes caveman on these things. And this is the most wind of action if you're looking for it. You know, if, I watch the show for other things now, the relationships and everything else that's developed and building how people are to each other in the apocalypse. But if you're looking for the action, this is the part, last five minutes of the, of the episode. He by hand goes and kills three of these things man he smashes one of them into the ground there's another one that he just kind of grabs and like tears its throat and lower face out of it entirely right then another one he goes and he grabs a bone there's just like a femur laying around on the ground and he grabs the bone and gets up behind the thing and he starts to go and put it in a full nelson but while he's doing that he just kind of rips the top of his freaking head off as he rips the bone up through its jaw so very very gruesome and cool if you like that sort of thing uh, the chat, or the, no, I should say the chapter, I'm used to doing chapter reviews and things. The episode ends shortly after that, where all of a sudden, we heard some, sounded like uh, machine gun fire coming from, we have no idea what happened to Tara and Melody, they were behind him, maybe 20, 30 feet, there's zombies coming, and then all of a sudden, you assume, I'm thinking these, these hunters, everybody's been talking about, whatever the case may be, and all of a sudden, who do we see but our good friend Martinez, who had left uh, Good Governor, of course, months ago, and we don't know how many months have passed, but at the beginning of the, the episode, I guess you would say, and, uh, and he's kind of like well now look what we got here type of thing so that's how the episode ends right and i saw the scenes for the next episode and it looks like it's another governor episode and i'm going to be honest with you with the mid-season finale approaching and 16 episodes being kind of a shortened season as it is when you compare it to regular uh tv nbc abc fox that sort of thing where there's usually 22 to 24 episodes you really feel like, I really feel like this story could have been told in like maybe a one or two hour special movie, like made for TV special they could have put in somewhere around there. And because, you know, there's none of the main characters in it anyway. So, you know, you get David Morrissey to shoot it and some of the other side guys. All in all, it was a cool episode in the in the sense that it did try to redeem the governor. It tried to show that he still has compassion and heart. And ultimately, it makes me believe that he really does have dual personalities. And, and like the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. When that switch flips on, boy, he's just fucking batshit crazy, right? And then he goes back to just kind of being this mild-mannered, like almost like Bruce Banner when he turns into the Hulk. And then he turns back into Bruce Banner and he's like butt naked laying around. And he's like, he has no idea what's going on. There's shit twisted around everywhere. There's people screaming. And he's like, he has no recollection of it it's almost that's what it seems like to me so um i'm gonna get finished up over here that's how the episode you know leaves off i was really hoping that live bait meant something to the effect of this is going to be the governor's you know attacking the prison and everything else but i think that they're trying to show some of his backstory um like like i said in the novels that they wrote so i'm definitely going to start reading those as well and hopefully be able to give my thoughts on them and, and you know hopefully this all ties in but ultimately though after last week's episode i don't know that you could have done a lot to top it but i i really did not want a just governor episode we got it anyway but it was good even though there was a few parts of it that were lacking so i guess my episode question is brothers and sisters weigh in on this one for me what did you think of the episode being just about the governor um leave whether love it or hate it just let me know in the comments down below feel free to hit the thumbs up the like button if you should think that i deserve it and uh subscribe of course if you haven't done so already we look forward to catching you in the next one nation as always brothers and sisters thank you so much for watching and we'll catch you in next week's episode hope you like the picture